All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Rebecca. It has been five years since I've been here. Oh, my gosh. What has happened? Well, KM World is still called KM World. That's cool. But uh, the M's changed. Uh, we've gone from knowledge management to the knowledge, mis knowledge mismanagement world. And I'm going to start with a story. Anyone from Vermont? Okay, you might know this story. It's Lake Champlain. So earlier this year in January, a lad gets a call from his friend. He says, hey, I've moved house and I'm having a party this Saturday. Would you come? And he's like, absolutely, I'll come. Uh, could you just text me the address? And of course he did. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get to new cities or I'm asked to go somewhere and I don't know where the hell I'm going, I put it into my favorite map app, right? So he puts in the address to the map app on the Saturday, picks up his two friends, and proceeds to drive to the new house of his friend. Now, the particular map app that he was using this day uh, instructed him to drive down the road, up the highway, across this little bit, and then drive down a boat ramp and right through Lake Champlain because it was the quickest way to get to his friend's house. Now, luckily, the Coast Guard was about a mile up road and came and rescued the three people that were in the car. And this is not a Dr. Chad. This actually happened in Lake Champlain. So I wonder if we're kind of, you know, outsourcing our thinking. What kind of knowledge mismanagement crisis are we in? Now, not to be outdone, my friend Rebecca here is from Brisbane. So there were three uh, Japanese tourists uh, vacationing on the coast outside of Brisbane. And they went over to the coast there and they looked at this little island in Moortown Bay and they said, gosh, that'd be awesome to go visit. That's just, I look at that. There's fauna, there's flora, we can see that. So they rented a car from Hertz or Budget and they plugged in the address on the onboard navigation system that we all typically have these days on our, in our cars. Well. The onboard navigation system didn't tell said tourists that there was an ocean in the way. <laughs> nor was there a bridge, nor was there a ferry, and so they started to drive across the ocean to get to Moortown Bay Island. And of course, the Hertz rental people were a bit upset uh, with the car. You see, for me, today's reality is that we're, we're nuts. Like five years ago, I think we had, a, we had a little bit more patience and resolve, and we actually thought better. Five years later, I'm back. Thank you, Jane. Uh, it's not getting any better, folks. I mean, our cultures aren't better. Engagement's not better. I feel like it's an apocalypse. Uh, so we can't believe that it is getting better, and your job is to go back to your organizations tomorrow and say, it's not getting better. We need to do something about this. So case in point, driving. In Canada, uh, in 2016, uh, the number of vehicle deaths as a result of distracted driving outpaced those caused by drunk driving. That's my country. That's where I live. That's why I'm wearing the poppy today. Remember, today is November 11th for us. Uh, in this country, in 2017, vehicle accidents as a result of distracted driving outpaced those caused by drunk driving. So then I start thinking, no one laughs. It's just talk about thinking, and then we're like, yeah, in. Yeah. I do this, do cogigo ergo sum. And I think to myself, well, mothers against drunk driving have actually made inroads, as has every police force across America and Canada. We, we no longer think it's a good idea to drink a Mickey of rum or eight beers and then drive home, right? We've, we've handled that somehow. But... We think it's a good idea to drive 80 miles an hour down the highway and, you know, oh, I'll just answer that text. Yeah, I know it's my boss. She really needs this now, so I better answer it. Why? Why are we doing this? And then we get to work. And many of us, like my friend Stan Garfield will know, is we sit around a conference call phone and we sit on conference calls all day. But there's something that happens in the conference calls that we've seen called conference call bingo. <laughs> so it starts with, uh, hi, who just joined? Right? <laughs> then it goes to, uh, are you there? Are you there? Are you there? No, they're not. They're busy. Uh, sorry, I'm double booked. Well, you are nuts because now you're just frenetic. Uh, can everyone go on mute, please? Because you're all multitasking, right? And you just forget that you're on mute. I'll have to get back to you on this one. That's because you don't have any idea what you're doing. So, 
sorry, uh, the other call ran over. Right, because you're booked back to back. No one puts a 15 minute buffer in. Uh, sound of someone typing possibly with a hammer. Because you're multitasking. You've got more things to do than possible, right? <laughs> Guys, I have to jump on another call. Yeah, okay, yeah, you're stressed. And then, sorry, I was talking on mute. Bingo, because you were, <laughs> you're crazy busy. We have corporate ADD, folks, and if you don't know what ADD is, it's Attention Deficit Disorder. Remember, this is the Knowledge Mismanagement World Conference. That's what's going on. So it turns out 2000, in the year 2000, Microsoft started doing some research on attention spans, and they found that in that year, our attention span was 12 seconds. Not bad. Uh, Follow-up research in 2015 said it dropped to 8 seconds. Now, I know you're math wizards. That's a 33% drop. Now that's not good, because that's going the wrong way. I said drop. Should we go in the other way at least, right? We're basically walking around like this. Squirrel! <laughs> Speaking of squirrels, why is there a goldfish in a wine glass? A, I like wine. Shirazes, if uh, anyone wants to buy me a glass later. Uh, and it turns out that the attention span of a goldfish is nine seconds. <laughs> We're at eight, they're at nine. <laughs> Now, they don't have a lot to do during the day, but they're still not as distracted as us. It's crazy. And if you go to China, they now are compensating for our inability to stay focused and attention span, and they have texting lanes. I wish this was doctored. It's not. It's for reals. Okay, so then I set out to start writing this book about open thinking, as I call it, and I was finding that I was still gravitating to football, soccer, because I love, I was, wasn't getting a lot written because I kept watching Man United lose and every coach that's going through my club. So then I started thinking about goalkeepers and penalty kicks. So I go out and seek out anyone that's done research on goalkeepers and penalty kicks. Why? Well, I was wondering how often the goalie moves and if they have a propensity to be busy in a penalty kick. Now, if you're unfamiliar with soccer, uh, essentially, if it's a championship round and people have to move on to the next uh, game or you have to win the game itself, you play some extra time if it's tied at the end of 90 minutes for about 30 minutes, and then if it's still tied, you go into penalty kicks. So here's the research out of these three uh, academics at, in Israel at a university there. And I talked to these guys, it was amazing. So 10 years, they went and studied all penalty kicks taken in the world, basically, in female and male matches that led to a result having to ensue. What happens? Well, funny story. 93.7% of the time, the goalkeeper moves left or right. <laughs> so before the punchline, I asked the researchers, well, why? Well, they want to look busy. They don't want to look stupid when a kick is uh, happening and they, they, got to, they got to feel like their team is not being let down. If, the, if they're not moving, they stand still, then, you know, they haven't done anything. I'm like, okay, what's the percentage of time that the kicks go down the middle where they didn't have to move? And they're like, ha-ha, 33%. <laughs> so they move 94% of the time left or right. A third of the time, the ball goes straight down the middle. So they should stand still and think not pretend that they've got to be busy in order to be busy. So think of that as like a meeting. We're busy in meetings, right? Back to conference call bingo for a second. Turns out Harvard did a study on this and about 71% of all meetings are unproductive and inefficient. Great. So that means seven out of every 10 calls you have a day are useless, don't go. Uh, NSC in Canada and National Statistics Council found that from the frontline team member who's a call center agent all the way up to the C-suite, total, total employees, 37% of our time is, are spent in meetings. Now think about the hierarchy of an organization. How many meetings should a call center agent be in a day? Zero or 0.1, because they gotta have their one-on-one -on -one meeting that month, we hope, and maybe a team meeting, maybe like fun. So let's give them three hours. Three hours of 160, that's what, 2%? Okay, is that fair? Okay. If it's 37% of the time, how much time do you think like managers and above are spending in meetings? Right, 120%, I would say. Okay, next up, Atlassian, our friends there, right? 73% of employees do other work in meetings. So three quarter of us are basically like that conference call. Uh, Jimmy, are you here? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Bullshit, you weren't on mute, you were doing work. <laughs> Jimmy. Harvard Business said 64% of meetings all come at the expense of deep thinking, so that's actually using your brain. Uh, Info security for my friends in Europe found that 70% of us are doing 30 minutes of work a day from bed. 
So that means we have outsourced the alarm clock that we used to buy for $15, and where we would basically say, okay, we will wake up at 6.44, and then we'll get up and have a shower, right? We put our phone there to pretend and mask as the alarm clock, yet we go to bed answering texts, wondering why our boss is emailing us at 11.30 at night, and then we wake up, we're like, oh my God, my boss emailed at three in the morning, I better email that too. 30 minutes a day from bed, amazing sauce. And then the APA, oh, no correlation whatsoever, right? American Psychology Association says a third of us are suffering from chronic stress. No causality, no, not at all. By the way, mid 80s, it used to be 10%. Squirrel! <laughs> what about being busy and always on? Well, Radicati, good folks here in town, do this survey every year that you know about. It's the email survey. And they said this year we'll send and receive 281 billion emails a day. And they forecast in 2022 that it will rise to what, 333 billion. Now, yes, there's population growth, but that's absurd. And they've been right every year since they started doing this in the late 2000s. Crazy sauce. So that's a lot of content, isn't it? A lot of things to keep up with. DMR says that basically on average, we are sending and receiving each of us 161 emails. And then I start thinking, okay, well, this is the Knowledge Mismanagement World Conference, right? We used to just have email, but then what happened in the last 10 years? Social media. And every time we think of these surveys of just email, what about the, quote, DMs on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and what I call the Instagramification of our lives? Or what about WhatsApp or Snapchat or any of the other things that are coming up and the number of pieces of content that you're viewing all day, every day? And the dopamine hits that you need to fulfill of the little red tag that says, oh, look, six new likes on my cat photo. Oh, look, 15 people reshared my cat video. I better do it again. Dopamine, 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 dopamine is adding to the content fuel of us being distracted, frenetic, and busy. So there's some stats from Mental Health America. 46% of us, a squirrel! What, am I, what was I talking about? <laughs> All right, have difficulty concentrating in the workplace. Jimmy, you're still on mute. Oh, Jesus. 77% of us are, quote, always or often spending between 31 and 40 hours a week distracted at work. Now, I'm, I got the math minor, but the way I unpack this is that basically all of us are distracted all day. That's the way I get it, right? And then quite seriously, the same organization found that between 50% and 57% of any employee, frontline, mid-management, or C-suite, are bringing stress home that affect personal relationships. Oh my God. And then the granddaddy of them all, Gallup, right, has been doing engagement scoring since, I don't know, the Cenozoic era, and <laughs> nothing has changed. We're still basically 30% engaged, 50% of the organization walking around like this. <laughs> Meh. <laughs> Whatevs. I don't care. And then 20% are showing up with a match and lighting the building on fire. So I freak out like a giraffe. It's like, what in the bejesus is going on here, right? So what to do? Well, uh, first of all, don't do this. If you live in a condo, this is not a hot tub. You can't do this. You'll fall, this bad thinking, just bad. And then we just can't put signs up like a zombie apocalypse, to protect, like, like texting lanes and signs like this, like, you know, look up, yield to the walker. Okay. So I want you to think about two words for your organization, reflection and a surprise. Reflection means we're pausing, we're ideating, we're marinating in the moment, we're taking back the qualitative dreaming that we've let go of. We are repatriating time. That's ours. And we're inculcating a culture of ideation, of love, of humanity, of relief, of unleashing us back to civilized people who weren't frenetic. Squirrel! <laughs> but you see, you're smart enough to know we still have to get stuff done. So we need to balance reflection with action. We just need to stop taking action all the time. So you get a green check mark, as do your employees, if you know how to balance action with reflection. That's in the top right quadrant. But if you're always on and busy, you're in the bottom right. If you pause way too much, and as Ansov called it, paralysis by analysis, you're in the top left, you're a fence sitter. 
And if you're bringing a match to work, you're in the bottom left, right? So I thought I'd explain this as a metaphor because I'm a metaphor guy, popcorn. So raised, uh, well, raised for a bit in England, then we moved to Canada, and ultimately my parents taught me how to make popcorn the real way, not a microwave, but with kernels and oil and a pot, and you put it in, you, okay? So it's the real way. So let's explain that. So for me, uh, when it's movie night, right, and the kids say, uh, it's time for movie night, right? Let's watch a movie for the 18th time, like Finding Nemo or whatever it is. Uh, we get that great popcorn pot out, and then you have to think about what oil, right? Vegetable oil versus olive oil. Please don't use coconut oil. It is ridiculously rancid. Don't do it. Then there's different types of kernels, right? You can use the multicolor. You can use Orville. Use the cheap stuff. You look out like it doesn't pop. Anyway. So you're making, you're dreaming, right? You're making decisions. And then you've got to think about temperature. How long does it go on? Okay, so if you figure that all out, and the timing is right, and you're calm, all right. You got great, fluffy, or delectable, I should say, popcorn. Now, what happens if you're frenetic, impatient, too busy, and you're like, I just, I just, I just got to get, the kids want the popcorn. Okay, you get oil and kernels. That's it. And you'll scold them. They'll have to go to the hospital. There's blood. <laughs> Don't do it. If you spend too long thinking, right, and you're dreaming about, well, what, what kind of kernels? How long does it stay on the oven top there, the stove? Oh. Do you guys smell something? What is that? And then your popcorn turns burnt, and that's gross, right? The goats hate you. It's goats are my kids, right? But then, um, okay, what if you're disaffected and disenfranchised, right? What, what goes on? Right? Look, fire! Get out! Did we do fire drills today? No, we didn't. See? It's crazy. So. I basically want you to think about being the open thinker for you and your org. You're in the top right. You're balancing this. We'll get to how. But if you're on the bottom right, you're inflexible because all you're thinking about is being busy. You're in, indecisive, sorry, if you're in the top left because you don't know how to move forward. Maybe that's part of fear, though. Maybe your organization is running around with its leaders fear-basing everyone. But then in the bottom left, when you're indifferent, right, not so good. And my very unscientific research suggests that essentially about 10% of us are actually in the top right. Top left is 20, bottom left is 20, and then we've got half our org that are just bat bleep crazy. All right, I'm Canadian, I'm agnostic, this is not about politics. I'm going to bring you back to the summer of 2016. Canada is like, uh, I guess, Switzerland, but Switzerland is like Canada, so we're, you know, we're, we're that. Um, so in that lead up to the election, as we all know, in the fall of 2016, what happened? Well, WTOE5 News had issued a press release from the Vatican. Pope Francis endorses candidate Donald Trump. It was beautiful, photos, everything. And it got shared a million times. Oh. Pope Francis, oh, I gotta share this with my friend. Oh, of course, Pope Francis. Oh, I'm Roman Catholic. I am, I'm Roman Catholic. I should share this with my Roman Catholic friends. Teeny, tiny little problem here. Because about a week later, the Vatican got news of this, and what they do? Issue their own press release. And what did it say, in essence, a paraphrase? Pope Francis doesn't endorse a candidate anywhere in any country. Uh, the candidates uh, are the countries. Uh, the citizens of that country should follow and do their research and make good decisions. Love the Pope. <laughs> but how many people just quickly, whatever your politics, how many people just quickly shared the news without doing the research, without going back and saying, hmm, is this true? Why didn't Pope Francis endorse Justin Trudeau? <laughs> That's weird. He's Catholic. Hmm. But take it back sort of 70 years ago. And when Germany was knocking on the door in 1939 of France, France and Charles de Gaulle and company sort of had this very quick meeting. Okay, what happened in World War I? Right, trenches. That worked. But let's make better trenches. Let's fortify them. Let's build them larger. And they did. That red line is called the Maginot Line. And uh, as much as I married a French gal and I lived in Paris for a year, uh, sad to say that, you know, the Germans didn't think that way. They're like, no, 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 let's do something different. And I'm not a Nazi sympathizer, this is history. So they invented a whole new type of warfare called Blitzkrieg. In English, it basically means lightning warfare. It's kind of like Sun Tzu. You attack from the, the flanks, from the sides, and from behind. And literally, France fell in a day. 
But those heavily fortified Maginot Line trenches had cinemas, and you get your hair cut. Uh, there were shopping malls. It was fantastic, except the fact that it was legacy thinking and quick thinking. So imagine if you're in France in 1940, you're like, well, Jesus, like, is the world going to save us now? Because that was quick. Quick thinking can actually alter the course of history. Now, we all know it worked out for us in the end, right? But if you're a Frenchman or a French woman back in 1940, you're a bit worried about civilization. Or maybe you were in Maui early this year and you got this text. Anyone? I did. <laughs> what? The world's ending? <laughs> hmm. What do I do now for the next 37 minutes? <laughs> well, I'll have a Mai Tai. That's fantastic. It was 8.30 in the morning. Might as well. Let the kids sleep. They don't need to know this. <laughs> Good night, kids. Forever. <laughs> now, unpack this, right? What happened? Well, rogue employee ultimately, right, doesn't think and says, oh, not a drill? Boop, click. Let's send this out to 5 million people, including half the tourists that freak right out like me. Right, okay. But then, fine, you fire that guy, performance issue, but he's still thinking rather abruptly. <laughs> but what about the management? What was going on in the state of Hawaii that didn't prevent this from happening? Lots of meetings. Jimmy, you're still on mute. <laughs> right? That's what's happening in our orgs. And these types of crises occur because we're not stopping enough. Oh, yeah, we're not satopening enough. I guess I got that wrong. <laughs> like, seriously, this is happening. So the next time you're in a corn maze, <laughs> I just like saying that. It's like... Really? <laughs> Next time? <laughs> Don't think I'll ever go on one, Dan. Well, I just want you to remember this, this tagline. Dream, decide, do, repeat. Dream about where you are, what are your options to get out of there, make decisions, then start executing on that, do it. But you know what? If you get lost again, go back, do a little more dreaming, make some more decisions. That's it. I'm not making anything up. Now, uh, there's a chap in Sydney who runs two restaurants, uh, Sydney Key Harbor Restaurant and the Opera House Restaurant. His name's Peter uh, Newell. And Peter is an eight-star Michelin chef, if even that's such a thing. And I took him out for uh, dinner, weird. <laughs> and I said, look, I need to understand how you operate, because I think I'm on to something I just want to know. He says, oh, sure, Dan. And I said, so just take me through a day, basically, so I can understand how you guys think. And so he says, well, generally, I start going for walks every day. I go to the botanical gardens. I'll talk to the butcher. I'll talk to people in the street. I'll look at bark on a tree. Uh, and I just I get inspired. That's my dreaming. Hmm. Well, then what? Well, I've got to make a menu every week, and it's got to be different in the two restaurants, so I've got to work with the team, and we've got to also think about their inspirations, their ideas, but we've got to make decisions. What time of year? Uh, does Nutella go with fish? <laughs> and other decisions to be made. And then I said, okay, then what? Well, then I've got to execute, right? I've got to get into that kitchen, Sometimes we practice them, sometimes we don't, but it's, now it's showtime, right? Six o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, people are coming in, and so I've got to execute. I'm like, huh. He's like, well, then what happens during the execution? He's like, well, sometimes we've got to change on the fly because 50 people came in and they all want ribeye, and we've got like 12 steaks left. Huh, that's interesting, that's true. You'd have to go back, wouldn't you? Yeah, we do. What about allergies? Like, yep, yeah, sometimes we've got to like, you know, fix the kitchen so that there's whatever. And basically, I'm not inventing anything new, and neither is Peter. He's been doing this for years. Creative thinking, critical thinking, and applied thinking. Dream, decide, do. That's open thinking, in essence. So let's metaphorically look at Tom Hanks in a character called Chuck Nolan in Castaway, one of the greatest movies ever. So he gets blown out of the sky uh, from a storm. He's a FedEx systems analyst, and if you've seen the movie, he's like stressed. He's like, I... now, FedEx systems analysts, I guess, have to be, because they're trying to make things more efficient, but he's like uber stressed, uber frenetic, right? He lands on the island, and he's this fat, like overweight, stressed guy you see on the left. And he meets a friend, Wilson. <laughs> And then somewhere halfway through the movie, uh, you kind of see the tagline at the bottom, or the subcaption caption uh, called, or says, four years later. And he looks like this. And he's like this ninja thinker now. He's pausing, he's calm, he's in charge of his soul. Everything seems, well, there's no one else to talk to except Wilson. But he just, he physically looks different, he mentally seems different. And then one day, this door pops up on the island, and he and Wilson stare at it for about 12 minutes. And you're like, I paid 14 bucks for no dialogue and Tom Hanks and a volleyball staring at a 
door from a Johnny on the spot. But here's what happens. He's, he's actually being the open thinker. And he's dreaming, he's deciding, he's going between the two. And he says to Wilson, well, it's a flower here, but this could work. And what he ultimately meant was this could work as a sail on a barge or raft to get past the big uh, ocean waves that were preventing him from escaping the island. And he ends up being saved later by a ship liner. Many of us in your orgs, you are the Chuck Nolan that entered the island. And what I urge you to think about is become the Chuck Nolan who left the island. Because if you had a Galaxy Note 7 a few years ago, uh, you would know that this was happening, and this was happening, and this was happening. And it led to a $5.3 billion write down. Why? Because Samsung executives, sorry if you work for Samsung, uh, ultimately pushed that team to beat the Apple iPhone to its um, launch date. And there was a critical flaw that was overlooked in the battery that caused it to blow up. And you remember the flight attendants and captains preventing you from taking flights because they didn't want the planes blowing up back then, right? $5.3 billion is pretty bad thinking, I'd say, right? Let alone the text I got in Maui about I have 37 minutes to live from a missile from North Korea. Not good. Jimmy? He's still on mute. We'll come back to him. Okay, so what can we do? Well, this is the simple little model. Again, I am not reinventing bread. <laughs> it's three types of thinking. I started out in K-12 teaching for three years. I moved to higher ed for six years. And I've been in the corporate world since 02. Creative and critical thinking are taught in K-12, kindergarten to 12. We're not teaching it or we forgot it or we're not employing it. There's something happened. We do really good on the applied thinking stuff, don't we? We're great. We're awesome. Everything is awesome. We, that's what we do. We execute. But we've forgotten the other two, the creative thinking, critical thinking. So what can you do and what can your org do in creative thinking? First of all, write it down. <laughs> we think that we can remember everything, but we have forgotten what the prefrontal cortex is all about. And that has some skills with memorization, but not enough for us to remember everything. So get your people and yourselves to start writing it down. Second, for creative thinking to be unleashed, we can't be busy all day. So you can't over-program 8 to 5, 8 to 5, 8 to 5, 8 to 5, conference call, bingo. Can't do it. And amazingly, five years ago talking about Flat Army, I urged people to be collaborative and network. And I don't see that happening despite social media. We need to be physically touching one another in a platonic way, right? <laughs> we need to physically be networking with one another again. Because when you have the, the bumps, the, the, the water cooler chats, right? It is meaningful and things just pop. It's great. From an org perspective, not surprisingly, I urge you to still think about pervasive learning, the combination of formal, informal, and social learning. I think people need to uh, understand that we allow you time to mind wander and dream. We actually at TELUS have a dream office and a chief dreamer. Put those actual titles in so that people know that, yeah, we got this team over here in tech strategy, but that you and your teams are allowed to dream as well. That's how important we think it is. And, and ultimately, if you don't have a value in your value system that is about collaboration and it doesn't actually link to creative thinking, what, what's the point? If your employees don't know that they're allowed to creatively think and be collaborative, disengagement. On the critical thinking side, decision-making time. You gotta put it in somewhere in your calendar. It just doesn't happen on the elevator down to the lobby to get your Starbucks that has four shots and it's a venti, because that helps, right? Oh yeah, I'll just go get my eighth venti of the day. Also, when you are reviewing your own past decisions and taking stock of that, you're evaluating how well you made decisions to better your decision-making later. Take a scorecard, put it in a four-point quadrant, do whatever your kind of method is. But if you're not going back to look at how you made decisions, you're not going to be a better decision maker. From an org perspective, how are you not doing after-action reviews? This is KM world. If your org is not taking the mistakes, the tuition value of those said mistakes, and harnessing them, and learning from them, and sharing them, you'll never make better, better critical thinkers as an organization. And then secondly, from an org perspective, Netflix did this very well, a critical thinking uh, value and an accompanying handbook on how to make decisions. 
Netflix have 10 values, and you've seen in the valley that culture deck that they call it, right? Go find it, it's free. The first one is called judgment. It's about decision making. It has four sub points on what judgment means, and then there's a handbook on how to make decisions individually, as a team, as an organization, et cetera. And Reed, their, their CEO, came out two months ago, he has great crow, he said, you know what? I didn't make a decision all last month. You're the CEO. <laughs> He's like, no, I know, but we've got a lot of people dreaming and got a lot of people making good decisions now because they know what it means. Good God, that's cool. And then, again, we still have to do things. So the applied thinking side, I see this all the time now. People have 67 apps open at the same time. Their physical desk space has the eight venti latte cups from Starbucks or whatever, Pete's Coffee, right? You look at people's desktops on their laptops, I, it's, it's a gong show. You just see folders and folders, like... What is going on there? You are disorganized. Your inbox is disorganized. You have never even can't spell inbox zero. Like, get yourself organized as you execute so that you can execute better. Squirrel, distractions. So let's say, for example, your phone, right? I got my phone on here. It's on silent. I don't have vibrations happening. I'm not going to be, like, I'm not going to attend to it just because Pavlov's bell rang doesn't mean I need to go answer this right now. Or what about your laptop? Whether you use Chrome or Safari or Chrome, whatever, what's the other one, IE? It defaults these days to, like, notifications popping up in the bottom right or the bottom left or, or top left, anything that you have, right? Like, all of a sudden now you've got these tweets, like, ooh, I got tagged. But you were, like, writing a report due in an hour. What are you doing? You're unfocused. I think we need to employ distraction training in our orgs. I think we need to take back knowledge management from the knowledge mismanagement people. And then we also need to teach leaders about empathy. They have somehow forgotten that people are stressed, let alone themselves. And empathy, there's three types, I won't bore you, but it puts yourselves essentially in the shoes of someone else. Leaders aren't doing that. They keep adding more. Here's my favorite expression of all time, not. Well, we're just going to have to do more with less. Ugh. What in the bejesus are you talking about, dude, or dudette, right? That just means you're piling on more in no time left. So what does that do to the organization's engagement or thinking? Crisis point. So a couple of other things to think about, and then I'll get whacked out of here. So don't leave ideas or creative thinking just to the few, right? Make it an organizational trait. I urge people, uh, organizations, so I do a time audit. How much time are being spent in meetings? Uh, how much time is being done email? How much time is like working with customers? Like, do, no one does a time audit anymore, and maybe we, we should. KM practitioners ought to. Mistakes ought not to be reprimanded, because then we're not saying you can be creative, right? Or we're saying you can't be creative, sorry. Right? If, if there's fear going on, then no good creative thinking or even critical thinking is going to happen. They're just going to do. If you can break down the silos, which are still rampant and are non-flat army organizations, better thinking occurs. If you can improve, or sorry, provide improved guidelines for meetings, okay, we will never have meetings on Friday afternoons. We will never start meetings uh, after uh, 8.30 because of time zones or whatever. Okay, all meetings now that were 60 minutes will be 45 minutes, so we can give you 15 minutes back, and so on. Like, these are organizational norms that we've forgotten about and our employees are suffering. Um, where were we? Oh yeah, facts and data first mindset. Uh, again, jumping to execution without doing your homework, right? Facts matter. Be willing to visit sacred cows. And then the last one here, which I learned from 1-800-GOT-JUNK, uh, they do huddles. Every 11 o'clock, uh, they do huddles in their, t in their settings, like in, in each city. And the huddles are getting up to, up to speed on what's going on, right? It's, I mean, it might be informational or FYI, it might be data, it might be getting and gathering input and information, but huddles are important, so something to think about. Okay, and finally, doski secretur laporas nutrum capit, which is Latin for he who chases two rabbits catches neither, from David Evans McDonnell, sorry, about 220 odd years ago, so great quote. Help leaders with focus, right? Uh, I just, yeah. <laughs> So I have four suggestions, right? Uh, more in the book. Be mindful. Remember what's relevant and pivotal to completing the task. So we need to go back to mindfulness. It's not just an HR word, mindfulness. Attentive, 
You know, you've got to be flexible yet focused. I know it sounds ironical, but you have to be flexible with your focus. Otherwise, when you're too dogmatic, you're not going to instill any of the other creativity. Thirdly, ruthless. <laughs> That's the distraction parts. That's about blocking things out that are irrelevant, impulsive, etc. Don't let it take over you. Just because Silicon Valley says that you will now have notifications coming into your laptop doesn't mean you need to listen to them. Sorry for those that live in the Silicon Valley. Doesn't mean you have to. And then humanity, be humane, empathize with your people. They're not focusing because they're stressed, they're distracted, they're all the above. And here's a little story about Tay. Remember a couple years ago, Tay was the AI chatbot issued by Microsoft on Twitter. Learned a whole new language. Uh, turned out uh, it was a misogynist and a Nazi supporter. Great. <laughs> Not a PR nightmare at all for Microsoft, right? But then an employee wrote to the team and said, look, keep pushing and know that I'm with you. The key is to keep learning and improving. And he went on to say, it's so critical for leaders not to freak people out, but to give them air cover to solve the real problem. If people are doing uh, things out of fear, it's hard or impossible to actually drive any innovation. The guy's pretty cool, right? It wasn't the team lead, it was the CEO, Satya Nadella. That's an empathetic CEO who understands. We still have to push the boundaries in order to make progress. But let's allow that boundary to be pushed through good dreaming time, good decision making time, and empathy. <laughs> so in conclusion, my homage to Canada, if there's any Canucks in the house, you'll be familiar with this band, my favorite, the Tragically Hip. Now, it uh, just so happens that I, you know, over the years got to know one of the guys, and one of the guys, unfortunately, on May the 24th, had to issue a press release that said he was about to die because he has uh, had uh, glioblastoma multiform, GBM, which is brain cancer terminal, just like John McCain, just like Bo Biden, uh, just like Kennedy here uh, in town. So his name was Gore Downey, and he was the lead singer. And I got to know him, as they say, uh, he inspired me for many different things. First, I was a fan, and then I became, you know, colleague slash friend on the outer circle. On July 22nd, 2016, they started their last tour across Canada in my now new adopted hometown of Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. And he came out in these metallic suits like you see right there, and he changed like every set, and there were like three sets, and these hats that went to the ceiling and these big peacock feathers. And I was like, God, if you gotta go, <laughs> that is awesome. Also being a hat guy, infinitely jealous. <laughs> and so I asked, I said, where did you get the hats made? He's like, Lilliput Hats, Little Italy, Toronto. And so I might have gone to almost all the shows that summer <laughs> and I dragged the goats and Denise across Canada from Victoria to Kingston, Ontario. That's a little minor story, we'll talk about that later. But I go uh, later on in the fall to Lilliput Hats. And this is the front of the shop, uh, a cornucopia of colors and, and love and, and creativity and ideation. Now it's an open shop, so this looks, this looks like it's the back of the shop, it's a different room, it's not. It's this big open office collaborative space. And, and so I just sat in that that stool you see there, and I talked to the owner, Karen. I said, Karen, do you mind? I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I just like to see what's going on here. He's like, or she was like, uh, I don't know who the hell you are, but just sit down and shut up. <laughs> so I did. I hung out there for 90 minutes watching the Milners. Didn't even know the word existed. Hat milnery, old term for making hats from scratch. Felts, uh, not vapor. What's that called? Steaming, vape. <laughs> Hat vaping, Dan, good one, yeah, tweet that. Dan said the hat vapors, I don't know. Anyway, but um, so, so, so Karen became uh, bemused, I would suggest, uh, maybe even amused about me, and, and I said, look, I'm just kind of observing and I'm kind of in the middle of writing this book, but I, like, what's going on here is pretty cool. It reminds me of Peter uh, out in Sydney you're an artist and he's an artist and it looks like you guys are chatting about all kinds of ideas and then you're making some decisions and then you've got to do some vaping and then customers are coming in and they're saying, hey, you know, I kind of want this and like you're making different decisions and have to go back to the drawing board. She's like, uh, you're a freak, yeah, what the, like, where'd you come from? And she'd been doing this for 30 years. She went to London as like an early 20 year old and, and went into a millinery shop and said, 
that is what I'm gonna do. She found her purpose, right Kim? And she's been doing this for 30 years. And so I was like, wow, that's cool. And I, I go back to Victoria, and then uh, a couple of months later, I go to Toronto again, and I knock on the door, yeah, it's me, freak. And I said, can I, can I go through the process with you? Can I buy a hat? She's like, if you got 300 bucks, yes. <laughs> okay, I got 300 bucks, let's do this. And so I went through the exercise of dreaming and deciding and doing and back and forth and going back and repeating and doing it again. And this is my hat. <laughs> it's so nice, but here's what's nicer. Gord, Downey, what did he do? Well, he wrote, uh, hand wrote uh, on pieces of silk, five uh, different pieces of silk, lyrics to his uh, songs. And so she uh, decided to give me one of those and put it in the inside of the hat. And the lyrics are, done and done, night accomplished, if I had a wish, I'd wish for more of this. Which is my, every time I say that line, it's my, start tearing up. It's my homage to Gord, I suppose, but it's Gord's homage to us to be better thinkers. I wish I had more of this. But sadly, in 2015, this journey started for me on Mother's Day because uh, the goats, uh, three of them, and Denise and I went to a place up island on Vancouver Island in Parksville, and we had brunch, 10.30. 10 minutes in, a family of eight comes in. And it's like three teenagers, the mom and the dad, and what presumably are a couple grandmas and a granddad, right? Because they're older. And so 10 minutes in, Cole, our middle guy, like, does this. He's like, Dad, they're on their phones. I'm like, shut up, we're Canadian. Like, <laughs> so, he, cause they, so he's 11, right? And he, no, no filter, right? No prefrontal cortex. Uh, but he was upset because he saw them all on their phone. Now, they weren't all on their phone, right? I had a little look. And it was the three kids and the mom and the dad. So 10 minutes later, Cole again. Dad, I, I've been thinking. I'm like, just do it quietly, man. Because they're like right here, right? He says this. He's like, how many more Mother's Days do those grandmas have left? And I'm like, <laughs> just lost it, right? And he was right. They're on to us. We're distracted. We're not paying attention. And in fact, this got sent to me in May. It's a letter. Uh, it's not a letter, actually. It's an activity that a, 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 a grade two teacher in England did for her class. The question was, tell me about an invention that you don't like and why. And this grade tour says, if I had to tell you what invention I don't like, I would say that I don't like the phone. I don't like the phone because my parents are on their phone every day. A phone is sometimes a really bad habit. I hate my mom's phone. And I wish the phone it was one that is an invention that I don't like. And then you look at the picture and it's a phone crossed out and there's a bubble map, right? And you're like, I hate it. So in our lives, we need to fix corporate ADD and personal ADD is my point. We need to turn around because this is not good. So I, I leave you now with the 10 essential guidelines to open thinking. All right? Time is a crucial component of thinking for anything and everything can go wrong based on your inappropriate use of it. Be deliberately focused on what matters most in the moment for you squander the moment when you succumb to the allure of distractions. Take action only when deemed appropriate, for it is the foolish who rush blindly into completing an objective. Do not reflect to the point of impairment, for only the single-minded dreamer remains at the start line. Find your contentment in periodic breaks, then with steadfast busyness, for if you value progress as you should, the former unleashes superior results than the latter. Be flexible with your verdicts. Revisit decisions when necessary, for there is no chance for happiness when being dogmatic. Be organized and prepared, for the scatterbrained can leave a trail of confusion. Jimmy? It's still on mute. Do not allow a dearth of information or facts to act as an excuse for negligence to seek out the truth lies at the heart of your indifference. Do not hold thoughts solely in your head 
For if you do, they will undoubtedly be lost. And finally, open thinkers continuously dream, decide, and do. For it is those who close themselves off that suffer the ignominy of regret. Peace out, man. Back to my brizzy folks in the Gold Coast. Remember, you want fluffy, scrumptious, delectable popcorn. Balance your reflection with action. Be the chef of your own life, your own work life. Balance creative thinking, critical thinking, and applied thinking. Get to the top and dream, decide, do, repeat. Do it again. Go back down. In Korea, they don't sell bunches of bananas. They sell six bananas at varying ripe levels. Why? Well, they're thinking better than us. <laughs> Why do we sell bananas at the same ripe level, right? And I'll leave you with this to ponder because this is the state of our nation, even the College of Architecture and Planning <laughs> aren't planning. With that, I thank you. I will be giving away, well not giving away, uh, a few books.